Uh, reform or revolution, the fundamental question of our time. If socialism is the goal, how do we get there? Doug Green, our second panelist, um, or our first panelist, has gone a very long way to help clarify the historical curves of this question. Setting the record straight on Gramsci, the Italian communist who has been distorted by academics the world over, and giving talks on everything from dialectical materialism, the Marxist method, to the Spanish Civil War, and the beginning of the trend in the world socialist movement called revisionism, based on a support, supposed gradual series of reforms which lead to capitalism all the way to socialism without the need for class struggle and working class power. What strategy the socialist movement must take to move forward is constantly being posed. Usually there are the same general lines of thought when, which come into opposition with each other. On the one hand, you have the model of YSA, which is building working class power through mass, uh, through mass united fronts, trade unions, and other independent organizations that can maintain their own political perspectives. This is the only way we can fight to win. On the other hand, as the supposed method of socialist forming coalitions, the wing of capital they think will be most favorable to winning concrete reforms. This is considered the practical model. Such an outlook arguably reaches most developed formed with the head of Michael Harrington, the subject of Doug's talk, and an absolutely immense amount of research he has undertaken. Doug has done all of this as a rank and file worker and caretaker of his family. His work in life shows that you do not have to be professionally engaged in intellectual work to be an intellectual, and your work might even benefit from it. He has done everything from getting articles published in major left journals to a full book by Haymarket Press, the biography of pro proto-proletarian revolutionary Blanky called Communists in Virginia. Please welcome Doug Green. very honored to be here. I want to thank the organizers of YSA and everyone here for coming out on uh, early Saturday morning. And uh, also to just uh, say that my pronouns are he, him, his. And this talk is a uh, crib pretty much from a forthcoming book of mine on Michael Harrington. If I wanted to be snarky, it would be titled, I read Michael Harrington, so you did not have to. Um, but he is. And I also want to emphasize that the views expressed in this talk are strictly my own. So if you're upset with them, just take them out on me. And lastly, I wanted to state that this talk is dedicated to a very special friend and comrade of mine, who I met while writing the book. And help and the book wouldn't have been written without her. So, but the talk is Michael Harrington and his afterlives, and we are, I'll talk about his life, uh, his, several of his main major ideas, and his legacy. The talk will also be, uh, has been submitted for publication, and it'll be up probably in the next few days. So I guess we can get started. So Michael Harrington, who lived from 1928 through 1989, was the most important advocate for democratic socialism in the United States in the latter half of the 20th century. He is widely and deservedly recognized for writing The Other America, a seminal expose of poverty. Uh, however, Michael Harrington is not simply a public intellectual, but a political activist who developed a vision to make democratic socialism into force in American life. His strategy was to realign the Democratic Party by driving out the business interests and transform it into a social democratic party. This new party, the people, would not only represent the interests of the vast majority and pass genuine reforms, but begin the transition to democratic socialism. Michael Harrington's politics and vision have outlived him, and they remain the common sense of much of the American left shaping debates in the organization he founded, the Democratic Socialists of America. To just get quickly through his uh, early biography, he, the man who discovered poverty, as he was known later in life, did not begin in impoverished uh, origin. He, was, he grew up into a very comfortable middle-class family in St. Louis in uh, 1928. This family was both was, uh, Irish, Catholic, and Democrat, where those terms were practically synonymous. While he later did not so much identify as a Catholic or Irish Democrat, very much so. 
uh, religion, specifically the Catholic religion, was uh, a very essential in shaping his early worldview. And considering the influence of the New Deal, this was a very social Catholicism, seeing the need to pass reforms to mitigate the effects of Catholicism. And Michael Harrington uh, attended school in the late 1940s at Holy Cross and later in uh, the University of Chicago. He shifted, he shifted his major from law to more uh, literature, hoping to become a poet. He turned out he did not actually have much of a talent for that, despite hanging out in Bohemia, in both Chicago and later in New York. And he, ha he had a little difficulty trying to decide what he wanted to do with his life. And at one point in 1949, he was a social worker in, in St. Louis, where he had a revelation working in the, with the poor. And he realized he must spend his life trying to obliterate poverty and trying to work with people who were, in, who were living there. Uh, although he was determined to fight poverty, he had really no idea how to do it. And by the early 1950s, after experiencing a recurrent crisis of his Catholic faith, he was living in New York at the time, and when the Korean War broke out, that year he actually became an objector to the war. And he rejoined the church, but specifically he rejoined something called, or a group called the Catholic Worker, which was founded by Dorothy Day, who was a former uh, socialist. And this was probably one of the more vibrant expressions of left-wing Catholicism in the United States, where the Catholic Worker movement had acted to improve the lives of the poor. They preached absolute pacifism and urged its adherence to live in accordance with the justice and uh, charity of Jesus Christ. And Michael Harrington did say it was as far left as you could go within the church. And Michael Harrington worked in the soup kitchens. He tried to live his faith, and he edited their journal, The Catholic Worker, on labor struggles and poverty. But he also made speeches. He developed connections to the literary world and the anti-communist left. And in 1952, he met a member of the Young People's Socialist League, which was the youth wing of the Socialist Party of America. And he was very quickly recruited. He joined the, uh, the Young Socialists. And he left the Catholic Worker and ultimately the Catholic Church himself. But from the moment he joined the, the Young Socialists, he was in conflict with their leadership, or the leadership of the Socialist Party itself. Due to the Cold War, the Socialist Party and its leader, Norman Thomas, accepted the prevailing anti-communist consensus and supported the Korean War. Michael Harrington and his faction of the Young Socialists opposed Thomas and began working with Max Shackman's Independent Socialist League, or the ISF, which opposed the Korean War. Eventually, Michael and the, the young socialists severed their ties with the parent body, and they, in 1954, they joined with Shackman to create the Young Socialist League, or the YSL. And Michael Harrington proved to be a major asset for Max Shackman and the ISL. He wrote and edited for a number of socialist papers on a vast range of topics, and in his capacity as an organizer, he traveled across the country to different college campuses where he was recognized as an up, as one of the bright stars of American socialism. Now, Max Shackman himself would be the subject for a separate talk. Uh, he was a fascinating figure, a former communist and Trotskyist. He ended up being, uh, being Michael Harrington's most important political mentor. The influence was something that Harrington himself acknowledged after he broke with Shackman in later years. In the dedication of one of his books, Harrington stated, even though I have some serious disagreements with him on issues of socialist strategy, I am permanently and deeply indebted to Max Shackman, who first introduced me to the vision of democratic Marxism, and whose theory of bureaucratic collectivism is so important to my analysis. Harrington took from Shackman a deep-rooted anti-communism that the Soviet Union was a bureaucratic collectivist evil empire. He also adapted Shackman's politics in other respects, an adaptation to social democracy, alliances with the labor bureaucracy, and support for realignment in the Democratic Party. This is not to say that Harrington's politics were strictly identical to Shackman. He was uh, able to expand and develop Shackman's ideas and was willing to break with him on secondary issues when necessary. And during the Red Scare era, life on the socialist left was largely confined to small groups on the margins of political life. Michael Harrington wanted to change that. 
He became open to joint collaboration with liberals in pursuit of progressive causes. However, Michael believed that common work could only be effective if socialists had an organization of their own. And an opportunity came to regroup the American left in 1956 with Khrushchev's famous speech denouncing Stalin and the near total collapse of the Communist Party of America. Suddenly a new political space was open and both the ISL and the Socialist Party hoped to take advantage of it. And realizing their, realizing their mutual goals, the ISL and the Socialist Party fused two years later. By now, the ISL had abandoned its commitment to the revolutionary transformation of society. And considering that the Socialist Party was practically on its deathbed, ISL members such as Max Schachman and Michael Harrington quickly assumed positions of prominence. And the merger did leave Michael Harrington hopeful that the left had finally had its own organization and would soon have a major impact on American politics. As part of a new strategy for socialists, Michael Harrington was no longer concerned with the revolutionary seizure of power, but with pragmatic and realistic questions about using the existing institutions to effect change. To that end, he argued that socialists needed to support progressives in the Democratic Party to achieve reforms. He also argued that left-leaning members of the labor bureaucracy, such as Walter Ruther, were not obstacles to the development of class consciousness, but allies. According to Michael Harrington, the Rutherites were the genuine and utterly sincere militant left wing of American society. And during the late 50s and, six, and early 60s, he played an active role in the civil rights movement where he worked uh, closely with important figures such as Bernard Rustin, and Rustin was a major organizer for the Montgomery bus boycott and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington. Harrington and Rustin shared Shackman's vision of allying the civil rights movement with organized labor and the Democrats. As part of this work, Michael, Harrington, Michael wanted to keep the civil rights movement on a moderate course and work to exclude communists from any organization he had influence in. And it was in 1962 that Michael Harrington first rose to national fame with the publication of The Other America. Even though he wrote dozens of articles and a dozen books on a vast range of topics, his name is synonymous with that book, which is a groundbreaking and moving expose of poverty in the United States. It established Michael Harrington as a respected public intellectual and advocate for the poor. And it stirred the conscience conscious, uh, of people in all walks of life by revealing the grinding poverty that existed in the richest country of the world. Martin Luther King once jokingly said to Michael, you know, we didn't know we were poor until we read your book. The Other America's impact extended beyond the circles of idealistic students into the corridors of power, where it was quickly picked up by president, both Presidents uh, Kennedy and Johnson, and Johnson himself was inspired to use it to help expand the welfare state and develop the Great Society. And Michael Harrington himself actually served as an advisor for President Johnson in developing Great Society programs. Uh, and now, while Michael Harrington supported the Great Society, he believed ultimately the welfare state would not overcome the contradictions of capitalism. He said, capitalism socializes private priorities and is institutionally opposed to any redistribution of the relative shares of wealth. This is related to its propensity for crisis and ultimately its self-destruction. In this context, the welfare state is seen as an ambiguous and transitional phenomenon, the temporary salvation of the system, but also the portent to its end. As student radicalism emerged, Michael Harrington was hopeful about the, their prospects to revitalize the American left, provided those students received proper guidance from him. To that end, he served as an, a mentor to the young radicals, the Students for a Democratic Society, more well known as SDS, in developing their famous Port Huron Statement. And this, this that pure Port Huron Statement was one of the defining documents of 60s radicalism, according to a historian of uh, SDS, Kirkpatrick Sale, it provided a new generation of students, uh, it gave those dissatisfied with their nation an, an analysis by which to dissect it to those pressing instinctively for a vision of change, of what to work for, to those feeling within themselves the need to act a strategy by which to become effective. No ideology can do more. Michael Harrington's ideas are quite visible throughout the Port Huron Statement in stressing the necessity for the student movement allying with the civil rights movement, labor unions, realigning the Democratic Party, and supporting liberals, and of course, rejecting communism. However, the Port Huron Statement also condemned American imperialism for instigating the Cold War and rejected and, uh, very fierce anti-communism. Michael Harrington found that abhorrent and was enraged 
and he had the parent body of SDS cut off the SDS's uh, funding and change the locks on their office doors. And they later interrogated uh, SDS radicals for being soft on communism in their own little show trial. Eventually, cooler heads prevailed and the break between Michael Harrington and SDS was avoided, but for the rest of his life, Michael Harrington regretted what had happened and believed that a cl the clash resulted due to a misunderstanding between two different generations. While well, he acknowledged his lack of diplomacy and tact in handling SDS, he did not believe he was wrong on the larger political issues at stake, as he said. But if I am quite ready to acknowledge my personal failings in this unhappy history, I am not at all prepared to concede political error at all the points in the dispute. Michael admitted that if he had been more tactful with SDS, that it would not have made a difference in the longer run. The conflict was, I think, inevitable. And had I acted on the basis of better information, more maturity, and a greater understanding of the differences at stake, that would only have postponed the day of reckoning. Ultimately, Michael Harrington's problem with SDS and the New Left was not just that they were soft on communism, but they rejected moderation and liberalism that were central to his politics. And that conflict between him and the radicals came to a head with the Vietnam War. When the Johnson administration escalated American involvement in Vietnam, SDS played an active role in opposing it. Like SDS, Michael Harrington opposed the war, but the main dividing line between them was over how to oppose it. Michael wanted to keep his lines of communication open to the, with the White House and liberal Democrats because he believed they were allies when it came to domestic reform. To Michael, Democratic support for the war was a tragic error and not a symptom of anything deeper. If he targeted the Democrats as complicit in the war, he could only alienate them something he would not do. To that end, he argued that the anti-war movement needed to be kept within proper limits and stay respectable. Therefore, he opposed militant action, the participation of communists, breaking the law, or anything that could actually end the war. Only when the Democrats were the, not the ones conducting the war after 1968, and large swaths of the public and the establishment saw it as unwinnable, did Michael Harrington come out against it, while his allies like Max Shackman backed the war to the very bitter end. And over the course of the 60s, Harrington's relations with Shackman strained and led to a split on a number of issues. Aside from differences over Vietnam, Michael remained steadfast in supporting the original vision of realignment, of supporting progressives in the Democratic Party and the labor bureaucracy, and he wanted to win over moderates on the new left. Shackman uncritically supported the AFL-CIO leadership, opposed the new left completely, and backed the most right-wing Democrats because they were reliably anti-communist. The, the faction fight between them tore the Socialist Party apart, and in 1973, Michael Harrington finally resigned from the party. After leaving the Socialist Party, he founded a new socialist organization called the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, or DESOC. DESOC had a so solid base of support among progressives in the labor bureaucracy and social democrats. Its strategy was the original one of supporting realignment in the Democratic Party to push it to the left. And to, to that end, DASOC supported the Democratic Agenda, a New Day style program that was supported by Jimmy Carter in 1976. And when Carter was elected, Michael Harrington believed the Democrats would carry out sweeping reforms similar to FDR or LBJ. Instead, the Carter administration did nothing of the sort and instituted austerity measures and ignored the program completely. Over the course of the 70s, DASOC grew and began working with like-minded socialist groups such as the New America Movement, American Movement, and eventually, these two organizations fused in 1982 to form the Democratic Socialists of America, known as DSA, and Michael Harrington was recognized as his preeminent leader. And the Reagan years were not good for Harrington and DSA. The labor movement saw crushing defeats, the New Deal was rolled back, and the Cold War escalated. To oust Reagan, Michael Harrington and DSA foresaw any form of independent socialist politics or militancy from below, but supported anybody but Reagan. This meant that DSA backed right-wing Democrats such as Walter Mondale in 1984. When Reagan secured a smashing victory that year, DSA's entire strategy was shown to be a dismal failure. The Reagan years saw crushing attacks on uh, to out of, uh, uh, so they, that meant they stayed aloof from Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, which was probably the most serious realignment effort in decades by backing conservative Walter Mondale. When Reagan uh, and in a postmortem of that year of that electoral strategy, Alexander Coburn, 
uh, who was later an editor for Counterpunch, said of the Democratic Socialists, they must now be foot soldiers in a campaign whose captains are implacably antagonistic to the principles of their constituencies. So in control are the democratic pragmatists, as the pollsters and pundits call for them, the ones who argue for party unity at the expense of movement and who propose that the way to beat Reagan is to denounce its excesses while accepting its premises. The pathos of their opportunism lies in their sh its short-sightedness. As every tactician can attest, the key to defeating Reagan is turnout. But turnout has political content and context. People will not simply vote for anybody but Reagan. They want somebody who speaks to their interests, who promises them more than they've got, and who offers them hope. It was mere days after Reagan's re-election that Michael Harrington discovered a bump in his throat, which was later determined to be cancer. After a series of operations and surgeries, it appeared the cancer was gone. But by 1987, he realized he had an inoperable tumor and given two years at most to live. And during those last years, he continued his political work, he continued writing, but ultimately, on July 31st, 1989, he quietly passed away. Now, from the 1960s until the end of his life, he developed a very sophisticated theory of democratic Marxism that he hoped would serve as both the ideology and political strategy for democratic socialists and the American labor bureaucracy. He believed that the tenets of democratic Marxism would enable socialism to break out of its political isolation, create a new political majority, and lead to the creation of a new society. And it was a very all-encompassing theory, touching on areas ranging from philosophy to imperialism. But we'll only touch on two right now, realignment and the transition to socialism. While he did not originate the idea of realignment, he worked to develop it into a full-blown strategy for not only transforming American politics, but as a necessary part of his socialist transformation. According to Michael Harrington, realignment was the only place where a beginning can be made, and he fervently believed that without it, all socialist efforts would ultimately fail. He claimed that the realignment strategy was based on a Marxist analysis of the changing nature of class society, and that after World War II, the social weight of the organized working class had declined, and if there was going to be a majority for socialism, the working class couldn't rely on themselves but needed allies something called, and he believed that this was located in the new class of scientists, technicians, teachers, and professionals in the public sector. And the emergence of the new class was a sign that the capitalist economy was moving towards collective forms of social life. And in Eastern Europe, China, etc., this collectivist form took the shape of a new tyranny of called bureaucratic collectivism. On the other hand, in the United States and Western Europe, collectivism took the form of the welfare state. And he concluded that society faced the choice of two possible futures between, uh, between bureaucratic collectivism that is anti, uh, of, well, barbarism and democratic collectivism or socialism. And this was his updated version of Rosa Luxemburg's warning of socialism or barbarism. For Michael Harrington, the issue was not whether to reverse these trends or whether the future would be democratic or totalitarian. The key to that future lay in the contradictory nature of the new class which had anti-democratic and democratic elements. And he believed that the expansion of education was necessary to teach the new class of planners, creating new opportunities for people for social advantage and prestige, and that the students were not destined to necessarily be future bureaucrats, but could be idealistic. They could take up struggles for change as the 60s struggles demonstrated. And therefore, the possibility existed for the working class, allying with the new class along with blacks and the poor, and would later include feminist, peace activists, environmentalists, to build a new majority or the conscience constituency. And he believed that only this new majority could bring real democratic socialist change. Eventually, the components of the new majority would seek political expression. And it did not matter to him if that political expression came in a new party or an existing one of the Democrats. And he argued that the Democrats were a site for struggle for socialists since they contained not only segregationists and the wealthy, but also held the allegiance of labor unions, blacks, and progressive sections of the new class. In other words, he claims there's a contradiction within the Democratic Party between its social base and its capitalist leadership. According to the Socialist Party platform of 1968, that the most progressive elements in American life thus belonged in the same party as the most reactionary is one of the most outrageous contradictions in the society. But it is not enough simply to denounce the scandal, we must abolish it. And he was emph emphatic 
that socialist work within the Democratic Party does not con constitute a commitment either to its program or leadership. So the Democratic left does not work in the Democratic Party in order to maintain that institution, but to transform it. And in 1973, he succinctly described their realignment strategy as the left wing of realism, because it's only there that the mass forces of social change are assembled. Despite the rise of the new class, he believed that the AFL-CIO was the leading force of realignment and the new majority. And he believed that labor unions, unlike in Europe, in America, had avoided independent political action in the shape of a labor or socialist party, but he had argued that they actually created one on their own. And it was unknown to most, in fact. He said it was invisible. Therefore, he concluded labor unions were not just another interest group in the Democratic Party, that they had already made an ongoing class-based political commitment and constituted a tendency, a labor party of sorts within the Democratic Party. And he argued that the first step of realignment will not be a revolution or a drastic lurch to the left. It will be a reemergence of liberalism, a new reform-minded, tough liberalism. And it will be more so with a socialist tinge. And this new robust liberalism was a short-term goal, and that, that meant socialists should look to liberals as natural allies. Therefore, the realignment strategy required patience and playing a long game but the promised result was the creation of a, a left liberal, if not social democratic party in, that would take over the democratic party, that would enact reforms and lead to the creation of democratic socialism. And for all this theoretical sophistication, Michael Harrington's realignment strategy re rested on a number of faulty assumptions. First, his contention that the democratic party was open to being captured by socialist forces this position assumed that the Democrats were a loose coalition of diverse interest groups, such as labor and capital, who were equally balanced. In fact, the Democrats are and always have been a capitalist-controlled party representing the more liberal elements among the ruling class. While Michael Harrington is correct that the Democrats do traditionally command the support of progressive and, work, and a, a working class constituency, this does not make the Democrats a party of the people. In fact, labor unions and progressive groups hold no power whatsoever in the Democratic Party due to the overwhelming capitalist control that exists there. Capitalist hegemony in the Democrats allows them to support, thwart any internal challenger to co-opt them as the need arises. This was a reality Michael Harrington never understood. Secondly, the left labor alliance needed for realignment was an illusion of his own making. Kim, Murdy, Kim Moody observed, that post-World War II liberalism, although embraced by much of the union leadership, was mostly a middle-class phenomenon. As a political current, it never challenged the corporate or private form of property. In other words, liberals were not reliable allies of socialists. To win the support of liberals, Michael Harrington argued that socialists needed to practice uh, to Ultimately, the liberals are, no matter Since realignment saw the uh, Democrats as the only political arena for socialists, this led socialists to support the logic of lesser evilism. And any Democrat, no matter how right-wing, that ultimately thwarted the goals of realignment. Lastly, the realignment strategy was doomed because it refused to develop an independent socialist organization. On paper, the Socialist Party viewed themselves as playing a unique role in realignment as an independent organization, free of compromising ties with the old party machine. In practice, this was something never carried out because it went against the entire logic of realignment. Christopher Leishich uh, argued, Harrington is correct in saying that there are no social forces automatically evolving towards socialism. Presumably, this means that radical change can only take place if a new political organization explicitly com committed to radical change wills it to take place. But Harrington backs off from this conclusion. Instead, he seems to predicate his strategy on the wistful hope that socialism will somehow take over the Democratic Party without anyone realizing what is happening. In the end, Michael Harrington forgot the lesson of Lenin, that in its struggle for power, the proletariat has no other weapon but organization, and without political independence, there was no room for socialists to develop strategies and actions to advance the interests of the working class. Instead, realignment, Force socialists to maintain good relations with liberals in the hope of reform at the expense of any form of revolutionary militancy. The natural end result 
of realignment and Harrington's democratic socialism was to transform leftists into the most loyal servants of the Democratic Party. And now, instead of a violent revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat, Harrington believed that socialism could be achieved peacefully through an electoral majority. And he drew, uh, in a great vulgarization, on the work of Italian, the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci. He argued that socialists needed to create their own counter-hegemony, block among the population, and that would undertake intellectual and moral reform that would involve building up upon uh, American traditions, particularly Jeffersonian republicanism and the, its ideals of moral virtue and citizenship. And this would, in uh, this new ethic, would re Americanize socialism and enlighten the people and mobilize them for change. And he argued that for democratic transition to socialism to be possible, socialists must uh, capture the existing state apparatus from the bourgeoisie. And in building on the work of uh, a theoretician named Nikos Polansis, he argued that the capitalist state was relatively autonomous and not an instrument of any single class. He claimed that in a uh, capitalist society, that the machinery of repression in the hand, uh, was false, tied to a base superstructure model of society. He claimed that the, uh, the ruling, there was actually no ruling class, just competing blocks of classes. And due to the great wealth of the bourgeoisie, they actually exercised greater power. On the other hand, if working for socialists could mobilize their new majority bloc, they could win concessions from the state and gradually tilt the state in favor of the ruling class. And his strategy was for socialists to utilize the state bureaucracy and undertake a transitional program of structural reforms, and that socialists could not dispense with the existing bureaucracy since it was essential. And the structural reforms he advocated were the socialization of investment, progressive socialization of corporate property, and later the socialization of private property itself. He believed that this transitional program could be enacted without any rupture or cataclysmic change, or without any resistance from the ruling class. And he, looking to the example of Sweden, he argued that it's now possible to have a relatively painless transition to socialization if, if socialists only learn how to encourage the euthanasia of the rentiers. And in looking for a positive model for this change, he defended the Communist Party's popular front. As he said in the 1976 with then uh, Socialist Workers' Party member Peter Camejo, my policy is very much like the Communist Party's policy in the 30s. You bet your life it is. I'm an opponent of communist dictatorship and totalitarianism. But while the Socialist Party and the Socialist Workers' Party were getting absolutely nowhere because they counterposed themselves to the workers who wanted to vote for Roosevelt, the Communist Party of the 30s was building the largest, the biggest, largest movement calling itself socialist in the United States since the days of Gene Debs and winning leadership in a third of the unions of the CIO. In other words, he believed in a popular front without Stalinism. However, his idealization of the popular front is based on a complete misreading of history, naturally. During the 30s, the, the CPUSA did have a visible presence in unions, free, uh, black freedom struggles, etc. But this came about uh, in spite of the popular front strategy. It occurred before it was implemented, when the party experimented with militant uh, united front tactics and still maintained a revolutionary identity. And after adopting the popular front, the CPUC retreated from its militant tactics in the interests of both the Soviet bureaucracy and fighting fascism. The communists ceased all criticism of the labor bureaucracy, the Roosevelt administration, and, and liberals. Over the course of the 30s, the class character of the CPUs changed as its members took up positions in the labor bureaucracy to discipline the working class and act in the interests of the Democratic Party. As a result of the popular front, the CPUSA ended up being the left wing of the Democrats and the New Deal, not a revolutionary or a socialist organization. And the hidden secret of why the anti-communist Michael Harrington idealized the popular front was not because it was proof that socialist, socialism had mass influence or spoke the language of ordinary people. Rather, he liked the popular front because it was when communists ceased to be revolutionary and gave up on militant action self-organization of the working class, and sectarian political independence to become loyal allies of the labor bureaucracy and liberals. In other words, it's when communists acted like Michael Harrington's ideal of democratic socialism. And his, Michael Harrington's popular front strategy depends on a complete, profound misunderstanding of the state. He's unable to recognize the state's dependency on both the existing bureaucracy and the needs of profitability. 
the ability of a socialist government to deliver the type of reforms he advocates ultimately depend upon that profitability. If a socialist government seriously pursued structural reforms, then they would, this would threaten the flow of profits and spark resistance from the existing bureaucracy. There are different limits upon what the state is willing to concede. And he also forgets that a socialist majority in parliament does not equal state power. Rather, real power rests in its in capitalist society rests in its unelected institutions, the, the military, the bureaucracy, and the courts, all of which will resist change and a democratic so road to socialism with whatever means are at their disposal. And this was shown when Spain's popular front government and Salvador Allende's socialist government in Chile were violently overthrown in military coups, wholeheartedly supported by the bourgeoisie, despite the fact that they were illegal. The reality is that no ruling class willingly surrenders its power and privileges was precisely why Marx and Engels said a violent revolution in the dictatorship with, of the proletariat was a necessary strategy for revolutionaries. And this is something Michael Harrington refused to acknowledge. All he could offer was moral appeals to the ruling class and faith that, that they will play fair with socialists, all evidence to the contrary. Now, the legacy of Michael Harrington is found in his group, the Democratic Socialist America which since the, 19, uh, I'm sorry, the 2016 election and the campaign of Bernie Sanders has grown to roughly 60,000 members and is the largest nominally socialist organization in America since the 50s. And it's seen chapters grow up across the country, uh, its members elected to Congress, and on the surface there appears to be great change in DSA, that there are now Marxist study groups in there at its uh, convention two years ago it severed its ties to the Socialist International and endorsed the BDS campaign to end, uh, to end international support for Israel's oppression of the Palestinians. However, does this mean that DSA is abandoning the politics of Michael Harrington and adopt a barking on a new course? In point of fact, Michael Harrington's strategy of realignment and his de and a democratic transition to socialism remain very much hegemonic <coughs> in DSA. DSA member uh, Maurice Eisenman, a biography of Harrington, argued that DSA is growing precisely by supporting Democratic candidates such as uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and those who propose breaking with the Democratic Party are left sectarians who embrace whatever policy or doctrine seems to promise the greatest personal sense of moral purity. Eisenman himself is a member of the North Star Caucus, one of the many caucuses inside DSA. And members of uh, many of the signatories of the North Star Caucus represent the Harringtonite Old Guard, who were either active in either Daystock, NAM, and the Labor bureaucracy. And that they may believe their main goal of DSA is to defeat the Republicans. And the inevitable logic of this position means that the North Star Caucus is committed to, the, to supporting the Democratic Party as a matter of strategy. And they, of course, believe it needs to be realigned. And some members of, of the North Star Caucus explicitly draw inspiration from Michael Harrington. One member says, Harrington is the guiding ideology of democratic socialism in the US, which is characterized by socialism that fights for free, honest, and open elections for achieving socialism best, based on democratic self-determination and for transformative change for the here and now, as opposed to totalitarian Marx and Leninism and, and Trotskyism. And, let's get the hand. While the North Star Caucus are champions of a realignment strategy in almost identical terms to Harrington, Others have tried to be updated for the 20th century, the 21st century. One such is Seth Ackerman. He acknowledges, Ackerman, that the Democratic Party is undemocratic, lacks a coherent program, and its leadership is unaccountable. Instead of simply uncritically supporting all Democrats, like the North Star Caucus, Ackerman proposes that DSA utilize the Democratic Party for running their own candidates on its ballot line. <coughs> For Ackerman, supporting the Democratic Party ballot line is not a question of principle, but a mere secondary issue, and that can be utilized on a case-by-case -case basis. And he believes that in order for a DSA member to run as a Democrat, they would have to adhere to a Democratic Socialist program and be accountable to DSA. In effect, DSA Democrats would function as a party within a party. According to Ackerman, his proposal would enable the left to organize to the point that it can strategically and consciously exploit the gaps in the coherence of the system in order to create the equivalent of a political party in its key ass respects. For all its sophistication, Ackerman's updated realignment strategy 
comes up against the same roadblocks as Harrington's original strategy and offers no solutions to overcome. All the factions within the DSA are formally committed to a democratic socialist road to power that Michael Harrington would feel quite uh, comfortable with. For instance, Bashkar Sankara, the editor of Jackman, and Joseph Schwartz are in favor of an expanded welfare state on the Nordic model, but recognize that socialism and democracy is good, but not good enough. They argue that capitalism undermines social democracy in the long run. And in line with uh, Michael Harrington's strategy, they advocate building a new majority where socialists must be tribunes for socialism and its best organizers along the model of the Communist Party's popular front. According to them, a new popular front would have a broad base of support necessary to implement non-reformist reforms to weaken capitalism and increase the power of the working class. The exact mechanisms of how that gets to socialism remains quite vague. A much more developed strategy of the democratic road to socialism was developed by the sociologist Vivek Chibber. And strangely, Chibber says that the left should look to the early years of the Bolshevik party as an example of a mass cadre-based uh, party that is rooted in working class communities. However, he does not advocate a revolutionary insurrection on the Bolshevik model since it is no longer viable, like uh, Sonkar and Schwartz. Chibber argues that the left needs to pursue a strategy of non-reformist reforms, that should make future organizing easier and constrain the power of capital. In the distant future, Chibber believes that socialism requires a final break with capitalism, but that the means of that are left quite unspecified. For now, he, uh, Chibber advocates the creation of a reformist Bolshevik party and a gradualist strategy. Now, while the name of Michael Harrington is unknown to most of DSA's new members, his ideas continue to shape the contours of the debate on realignment <coughs> reforms in democratic socialism. Some, such as the North Star Caucus, remain unreconstructed Harringtonites, while Sankara, Schwartz, and Schieber have attempted to make those ideas relevant to the present. Still, none of the Harringtonites have sincerely, uh, seriously confronted the limitations of Michael Harrington's strategy or how to overcome them. The growth of DSA's membership opens up the possibility that the organization may decide on a different course than the one envisioned by Michael Harrington. However, at the time of this writing, the question of that course remains open. So to offer a quick conclusion, Michael Harrington's hope was to make democratic socialism a force to be reckoned with in the United States. However, his realignment strategy meant that he prized tactics of moderation and compromise for fear of alienating potential allies. Realignment was based on a flawed characterization of the Democratic Party. And the requirements of realignment required no towing to liberal prejudices, prizing loyalty to America, and unquestioning reformist vision. As Michael Harrington's conduct proved during the Vietnam War, his whole strategy served as a break in a roadblock to revolutionary action. Whatever his socialist desires may have been, Michael Harrington ultimately reconciled himself to acting as a loyal opposition to the powers that be. Still, his ideas continue to shape the debate in DSA and the wider left. However, if the American left is serious about fighting for socialism, then they will have to completely abandon Michael Harrington's politics for those of revolutionary communism. Whether that happens or not still remains to be decided. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. We're going to open for discussion. Um, so Doug will be taking questions if anyone would like to uh, contribute. Uh, yes, yes, you. Yeah, so, what was, like, with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she, she was supporting, like, a movement to remove corporate Democrats in the primaries, like, is that, is that a good thing? I think it's good, yeah. It, it sounds good, but it's not our party. This idea that there's some kind of, uh, she also supports corporate Democrats. She voted for Nancy Pelosi. She voted for democracy funding in Venezuela. This idea that she's some kind of opposition to them is nonsense. It does sound nice, but it is perpetuating the illusion, and I am gonna use the term, that the Democratic Party can be taken over. I think that if we're socialists, if we're serious about socialism and, and revolution, that it means a complete, total, and utter break with the Democratic Party. This it must be a line of principle, and to quote the immortal uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard, the line must be drawn here. 
No support for the parties of the bourgeoisie. Okay, thank you. Next question. Ian. Yeah, I was wondering if any of these um, new Carringtonites have acknowledged um, the reality that um, the, of the time scale that climate change has imposed on this, because like, what is what is the time scale for their transitional program to like making capitalism behave better? It, you know, that sounds like it would take 50 years minimum, and we clearly don't have that much time. Have they acknowledged that, or are they just kind of ignoring that huge elephant in the room? That, that, that's a, a very good question, and I have seen them, you know, acknowledge it, you know about the scale of global warming, climate change, and all that. But mostly what I see, and I'm mostly going off what I see on social media, is they say, well, this is an imperative why we need to elect all these people. It's kind of left unspecified how that actually does anything to actually deal with this. Considering that even the, the watered-down proposals of the Green New Deal were voted down. Okay, what are you going to do now? And I feel like it's just a... Uh, I, I'm... Rec willingness to recognize that, listen, you're not going to reform your way out of this. You know, getting all your precinct captains, getting a bunch of candidates is, it's not just another election campaign, it requires a fundamental reordering of society. And I don't think they've really confronted the reality of that. This. Now, one of the um, obvious reasons that people look to the realignment strategy is just a lack of confidence that anything else could be built. Um, could you talk a little bit about alternatives to that? Um, what has been the history of independent working class politics? The U.S., the world, whatever you want to talk about. I mean, there are a number of examples just in the U.S. We have the early Socialist Party of America that in the first quarter or so of the 20th century started out relatively small, but became, had tens of thousands of members, elected members across mayoral uh, candidates, uh, several congressmen, but also did lead mass working class struggles in the streets. And the early years of the, of the Communist Party, and maybe even up to the Popular Front, I would argue, are examples, they did not have many elected members, but they were leading mass struggles in the streets. We have the example of, say, uh, Argentine uh, socialists who have a, a broad-based electoral alliance that, ha that has, has elected uh, several members to their parliament that does uh, focus on the streets. And, you know, there have been examples of, you know, I believe the predecessor for YSA, the SWP itself in the 60s, did try to maintain an independent socialist perspective. It was not necessarily bound to the needs of the Democratic Party in its uh, various work in, say, the anti-Vietnam War movement. And we could go down the list, you know, it would take more time than we have here today, of socialist, communist organizations throughout Europe and the world that have not, you know, su you know compromised themselves to support liberals at the expense of developing working class organizations. Next question. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just have a quick comment. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm Joseph, I'm from the Revolutionary International Youth. Um, a couple um, comrades here with me. Um, we used to be part of the DCSU YSA, so um, we changed uh, that to the uh, Marxist Student Union, so that it was like our Marxist politics. And, uh, so we look toward the international group. Um, and I think the subject of the discussion here today is dealing with these. Um, Cold Warrior Socialists, the State Department Socialists, like Michael Harrington, it's a very important issue for the left. There's so many socialists, including people who call themselves Trotskyists or even candidates who sided with counter revolution, just like uh, Michael Harrington did in um, the Eastern Bloc. Um, particularly important to this was, you know, the case of Poland and the rise of an organization called Solidarność, um, a CIA-funded CIA ultra-Catholic nationalist a counter-revolutionary organization that was disguised as a workers' union. Um, and so while many groups, including, you know, some of the same like social action, you know, back from their um, 
But then Rebel is Henry Spartacus. Spartacus is Henry II, which um, the town of Love Inc. that was proved to the line that now came from. Um, they were unique in fighting against this cold warrior you know, socialism that was so prevalent at the time amongst most of the people on the left. Um, Spartacus League at the time you know, uniquely waged a world historic Trotsky's intervention against counter revolution there. And I think um, that's a really important history that people who consider themselves Trotsky's, who consider themselves candidates, should really study closely. Um, James Cannon said, um, who touches the Russian question touches the revolution. And he also said, be serious about it. Don't play with it. Um, and this came from the fight that uh, Cannon and Trotsky waged against people like Max Schachmann, who wanted to abandon defense of the Soviet Union and defense of the worker states. Um, you know, there's an elementary Trotsky principle that extends to defense of the foreign worker states, including Cuba, which I'm sure most people who come with action would very strongly agree with. But in the case of East Europe, um, socialist action back, back Solidarność and, uh, you know, back uh, uh, coup in uh, the Soviet Union. And even in 1995, representatives of socialist action um, declared the class of Stalinism a victory for the working class worldwide, when actually it was the world was working. So I think, again, this question of Cold War socialism really needs to be addressed by people um, who are you know, interested in Trotsky's history. You know, Trotsky urged those in the fourth international to face reality squarely, call things by the right name, to be true in little things as in big ones. Um, and the question of counter-revolution in the Eastern Bloc is a very important one that relates directly with the politics of the fake left who are organized in the DSA, in the DSA and who are constantly you know, uh, working to redirect um, militant efforts into the Democratic Party and you know, to support imperialism under a you know, quote, democratic socialist labor. Thanks. Do you have a response to that? Or? That is a, a great topic actually for discussion. I will say that I did allude to it, I didn't have time to get into it here, but Michael Heron does adhere to essentially the Shackman side of that split. In 1940, the SWP, which I'm certain actually probably most people here are familiar with in some <coughs> degree. So, and that is a very important question because it did have practical implications on where he ended up and where Shackman ended up. Suddenly, if it was between two camps of the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, well, Shepold Shackman and Harrington decided ultimately we're going to quote unquote support the more democratic bloc which was the Western Bloc. And that had implications for how they viewed uh, any self-described communist or socialist. And they only wanted to deal with the democratic ones as opposed to those totalitarian ones. So it does have implications in terms of revolutionary politics. You know, the thing I would say to people who say, why do we obsess about these old discussions and questions about reform versus revolution or the 1940 split or, or whatever it is, is well, the issues don't go away, they keep reappearing. And we should at least be familiar with those old debates so we can recognize when they reappear. Okay, next question. Um, Gary? So, um, I know that Hudson Sinclair is also considered one of the founders of Democratic Socialism. Uh, did he and um, Harrington differentiate at all? Uh, Upton Sinclair, he, I believe he left the Socialist Party uh, in the 30s when he actually joined the Democratic Party to run for the End Poverty uh, Epic Campaign in, in California. I don't know of any actual interaction between them, but I, Upton Sinclair himself was a very reform-minded socialist. I can imagine that he actually would have probably supported Harrington. Because uh, Upton Sinclair, he's known for he's most well known for his book *The Jungle*, which led to uh, meatpacking regulations, regulations of the food industry. Whereas Michael Harrington's most well known book, *The Other America*, led to the wealth, like the great society. I can just, um, I would argue, I hope on very firm ground that they probably would have seen eye to eye on a great deal. Okay, I think we're going to take one more question. Um, in the back. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, my name 
name is uh, Ian Georgiana. I'm a hotel worker down in uh, San Connecticut. I'm joined here alongside other hotel workers like Hutch and uh, we'll pay down in Clifford here. Uh, you know, we're militants of uh, Unite Here Local 217. Uh, I'm also a member of Left Voice. I just want to say, I think this topic is very important right now because there's a big contradiction here in the, the kind of the kind of left of the DSA and me and other uh, other groups about the uh, about like electoral campaigns about the election of Democrats and you know, dirty break, clean break. At the same time, these discussions are going on. We've had more strikes last year than 30 years. The working class movement in this country is, is moving, now slightly, but it's moving. And that's where a socialist has to be. And I, I think, um, you know, in, in Sanford, that meant we went from 0% unionization in hotels to about 30, 40% of workers in uh, two, about two and a half years. The um, point of this, I think, is that when we're discussing Harrington and, and Democratic Socialists, it's also looking at how uh, Democrats and the labor bureaucrats are joining together. And in order to build, in order to build working class movements and struggle, it's in the workplace and it's through our unions. Um, so I mean, I just think uh, so I should go a little bit on, on what Harrington, a bit more on what Harrington did in the unions and that kind of politics. So I know in New York what it means is that people who call themselves socialists are betraying uh, nurses' struggle. They would say they want to go on strike, and now the uh, leadership's calling them back. Um, I don't know, a bit of my ramble there, but uh, you know, at the same time, we're looking at the largest strike wave in the past 30 years. Uh, too many socialists are getting uh, too interested in the electoral front. The thing I'll say is uh, historically, organized labor, as, as I'm sure most people here know, has supported the Democratic Party to the detriment of his own independent class interests. Michael Harrington, in line with realignment, supported the more left, quote unquote, uh, bureaucrats, such as Walter Ruther. But because he was tied, the labor bureaucracy supported the Democrats, that meant they supported, they didn't want to, uh, they squelched independent initiatives. The labor bureaucrats remained, even as more left wing, supporting the Democrats during the Vietnam War. They did not want to break with the party of imperialism, the party of genocide. And Michael Harrington remained an apologist for these people. He remained a supporter. And um, I'm going to bring up one example of, from 1981 during the famous Patco strike, where a union uh, with a, a I, I believe it was the I, IAM, which was uh, one of their leaders was a DSA member who refused to support the PATCO strikes because it broke the law and helped doom that strike to failure. Michael Harrington kind of threw up his arms. They weren't going to do anything to that DSA member because those people are fundamentally afraid of independent action. They're fundamentally afraid of challenging their liberal allies. And ultimately, because the Democrats are a capitalist party. They serve those interests. And the labor bureaucrats think that if they play nice, if they can whisper in their ears, they might get something. Instead, they're kind of just used uh, to, for funding purposes and routinely betray. And DSA, at least in the Michael Harrington era, ended up being essentially a pimple on a pimple. You know, they weren't going to really do anything. If the labor bureaucrats were powerless, what was DSA? to that. Nothing. They just tailed along. Okay, that uh, concludes discussion. Of course, there can be more discussion during lunch. Um, so now we're, uh, thank you, thank you, Doug.